Mwazu Magaji, the former Kanu Commissioner for Works and Infrastructure, has been sacked over his controversial comments on the death of President Muhammad Buhari's Chief of Staff, Abba Kiari. While reacting to the news of Kiari's death, Magaji, who had appeared to be celebrating the passing of Mr. Kiari, stated that he did, he did not do this. And also in Kanu State, a video showing a Governor Ganduje of Kanu persuading a young Christian girl to convert to Islam has emerged. Still with us to have a conversation on this is legal practitioner Raymond Nkanebe. Thank you very much Thank for staying with us. Thank you. And we'll be joined subsequently by a journalist in Kanu, that's Mohammed Bashir. All right. Was he misunderstood, do you think? I didn't get that, sorry. So was the commissioner, the now former commissioner, oh, oh, okay, misunderstood okay. Mm. as he is now reacting to, uh, though he has accepted his resignation, yes. he's saying he was misunderstood. Yes. And the question is, was he really misunderstood? Uh, well, I, I don't think he was. Because um, when you go back to, when you look at his choice of language, I think the language gave him away. You know, words are not just letters. They convey meanings beyond the faces of those letters. You understand? When you look at the, the, the I, uh, unfortunately I cannot uh, quote him now, but when you go through uh, what he wrote, you, 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 it gives you the impression of a man who, uh, who, uh, who was gloating or who somehow was happy that a force that he, somebody who, has, who he had always wanted to see out of the picture has eventually uh, gone out of the picture, but this time perhaps by divine intervention. So that's, uh, I'm sure that was what uh, fueled the presidency to um, alert the Kano State government and of course how he, how he ended But was up. it enough for him to have lost his job? You remember, we live in a democracy now. Everybody's, exp I mean, allowed to express um, yes. uh, their thoughts. Uh, the government, uh, let me see if I can find uh, the part of the statement where they said, um, the action of a public servant, personal or otherwise, reflects back on the government, and therefore the Ganduje administration would not tolerate people in official capacity engaging in personal vendetta or otherwise. Um, was that really the case? Is it enough for him to have been sacked? Well, I, I think he, he, he occupies a political office. He's not an elected official. His employment is not backed by any statute. He holds the office of the commissioner of this of, of works at the pleasure of the Kano State uh, governor, right? So uh, what that means is that, what that means is that he can, the governor may wake up one morning and decide to say, okay, I think so far you've done a good job. At this point, I want to get someone else to take up from where you you stopped. You understand? So it's not a question of whether uh, what he said is enough or not. Whether it is enough or not is at the pleasure of the governor and the political sentiment that would inform that decision. And clearly what we saw was a, uh, a decision taken on the basis of political and also uh, some bit of sentiment. How can a, a, a top member of the, of the APC uh, a political hierarchy lose his life? And then somebody who is also a beneficiary of that political structure, even though in, in, at the subnational level, suddenly takes to uh, Facebook goes amok and writing all sort of things, I think uh, it's entitled the governor to act in the way uh, they did. Though some persons might, uh, might hold uh, different views, and also as we heard him trying to save some face later, saying, okay, uh, I was misunderstood, and I was not misunderstood. I, I, think, I guess we'll still I take think, a look at some of the comments he made okay. in trying to um, explain the misunderstanding uh, that his comments uh, generated. Uh, but I'm told we have on the line now, um, journalist Mohammed Bashir. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to have you on the program. So what's happening in Kanu really? What could you, um, you know, just summarize for us as quickly as you can, um, what led to the ouster of the commissioner in question? Um, I think that the situation is... Uh, a bit more disturbing to those who are really interested in about the top of the situation in Kano. What the commissioner did is something that is impactive in some cycles in Kano. That he, it is a remark he made and it is considered to be inflammatory. And it is also against our culture, our making, the way we behave, the way of our interaction for somebody to pass such an inflammatory comment for a person who is dead. And what he did something that is widely considered 
by many in Kano to be an anachronism on his part, given his position as one who is very prominent in the cabinet of the Prime Minister, the Executive Governor of Kano State. Okay, um, um, Bashir, I don't know if you could speak up a little louder. We are actually straining to hear you clearly. Yes. Uh, are you hearing me now? Much better, much better. Go ahead, okay. please. The episode about the commissioner's statement has created a lot of controversy in Kano. And what he did is widely considered in Kano, most especially in the political cycle, as inflammatory, very unbecoming of a person of Kaliba Dean, the property part in the cabinet of the Tablai Umar Gandhi, the executive governor of Kano State. And what he did was automatically against the norms, the culture, and the religion of Islam. For somebody to have passed away, and for somebody of his Kaliba to make the remark that it's like a women's situation. And I believe there's no going to go well for him as a personality, as one calling the shots in the cabinet of the governor of Kaliba Umar Gandhi. So what he did is being considered, most especially in political cycles, as an act of vendetta against the dead person. Okay, w what is the feeler um, um, among the people? Um, was the sack harsh or was it commiserate with the crime that he has allegedly committed? Come again. I said, what are the people saying? Was the, was the sack, the, the sacking of the commissioner fair and commiserates to the crime? Or was it more aligned to sentiment? What are the people saying? What are, what are they telling you? It is the general perception and contention of the people in Kenya that what the commissioner did was a clear case of personal vendetta against a dead person, most especially the person of upper child. So he got it. Uh, what he did is what he has gotten from the governor. And his fact is widely been applauded. And the decision of governor is welcomed by many in Kano, most especially in political cycle. Okay. Um, before we let you go, we need to um, get your thoughts on the video that is in circulation that's causing some reaction of um, the governor um, allegedly trying to convert a young girl to Islam. What is your take on the way that the aid of the governor, to the governor, um, reacted when that video went viral? I think it is part of the usual social media hype. And I think it is best lesson and found it. And even the caliber of Governor Abdullah Martindi, I don't even, even in my wildest imagination, that a person of his caliber can go to such an extent to commit to such an act of uh, irresponsibility. I doubt it. All right. Thank you very much, Bashir, for joining us on the program. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Stay safe. What do you make of his submission? I don't know if you heard everything. Yeah, he's yeah, I heard a bit of that, but uh, let me just round off on the um, on the commissioner's um, uh, issue. Uh, for me, I, I think you, I heard you uh, describing what he did. Uh, an offense, even though, or a crime, even though he must have used that loosely. But I think what he did was closer to, uh, uh, it was closer to an um, uh, 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 act of misconduct. I think it borders more on conduct. I think that so is it's a, not like a, a it's crime. not a crime. It's a clear case of a conduct that is incompatible with his status as a commissioner of, of, of a government of a state who is also an, who, who is also part of the ruling, ruling party and who have, uh, uh, of which lost a very high ranking Ranking member, so it's more of a, a, a behavioral issue than a case of crime. Or you, you said something about the fact that maybe the decision also had a sentiment attached to it. Magaji issued a statement saying almost exactly uh, the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see if I can find. He said his sack was an emotional reaction to uh, his posting by agents around the office of the chief of staff who pressured mm -hmm. the governor mm -hmm. to do what he did. I want to ask, should sentiment be part of the decision making process? Couldn't there have been another disciplinary action that would have been taken, especially, for instance, if that commissioner was living up to his responsibility? Uh, uh, thank you. That's a very good question. Even I, I, I myself, I thought yesterday that I, if the governor had sat back 
and for some more hours. I imagine he would have taken a different um, decision. But you know, see, I think he acted in the heat of passion since at the time they were all still bereaved. You know, between the moment Bashir uh, Ahmed, the president, um, um, aide, tweeted at the legal uh, currency government, calling the attention to those tweets. And when we heard that he had been relieved of his duties, it was in the space of two to three hours. So it gives you a sense of an action that was taken in haste and definitely actuated by some sentiments here and there. So I, I agree it's, it's, it's wrong for him to be dismissed on sentimental uh, ground, but then uh, politics is also what, what it is. Okay, I think I should ask you this question, really. Okay. Um, um, according to the statement that was issued sacking the commissioner, uh, Mr. Kiari led a life worthy of emulation by serving his country to the best of his ability. Some say um, that the sacking of this uh, commissioner might be a uh, wrong precedence considering the fact that Nobody is that pure. Nobody is that noble. There must have been something that the person might have done uh, that was not in tandem with what the democracy we preach uh, is about. Um, are they stifling that aspect of freedom of expression when it comes to saying, um, this person did this during his lifetime, this person did this, during, or should we just have this blanket behavior over the years that the dead, no ill, should be spoken of the dead? Okay, well, uh, people are entitled to hold their views on an individual who has passed on. People are entitled to hold those views, and they don't have to be, uh, they don't have to be palatable to every ears. You understand? But, but then, when you, are having, when you are speaking as a private individual, it's different from when you are speaking in a public, a holder of a public office. You understand? Uh, of course, some persons made similar statements, even more, uh, more uh, egregious than what the, uh, the commissioner wrote. And nobody took any action against them. You understand? So I, 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 I think public office holders, as much as possible, must understand that holding a public office comes with a high degree of responsibility and also conduct. Do you think the lesson that was meant for the commissioner to be learned has been learned? And maybe some public official who has seen this um, unfold might be reminded of the importance of managing what they say, especially um, as regards their office. Uh, I, well, I, I, I imagine some lessons have been learned by persons who actually attach some importance to the office uh, they hold. Uh, I, for one, I consider what the man did uh, highly um, irresponsible, and it is, um, it, it's, it, it's, 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 we are Africans, and we know how much we, we attach to, to the dead. You understand? So uh, uh, I think he, he went too off the mark in trying to express his views on uh, how, how uh, the late Abba Kerry conducted his duties as the president. Uh, Chief of Staff. Okay, let's let that lie for a bit and check on with uh, the video. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> um, I, I, we, you've already spoken a bit on um, on that, but I want to look at the aspect of the response coming from the presidential aide. Uh, I think his name is uh, Yakasai. Um, he said that the, he was not trying to convert a Christian girl to Islam. The girl was a pagan, and it's a normal practice. Should that have been, should that video or the, the response have been handled differently to sort of push aside the uh, conspiracy theories that people are pushing out, that that was the intent of the governor? Okay, well, I think in the circumstance they found themselves, that was the only plausible um, uh, alibi to 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 sell out there. Yeah, is it an alibi? Uh, uh, alibi, uh, in the, it, alibi in the okay. That means you, you, if you say it's an alibi, that means you're saying that the, the governor did actually do something. Well, I, I uh, feel wrong. Uh, in order to in order to balance, in order to douse um, the the emotions that we know this is an issue of faith, and we know how we can be very very attached to issues of uh, religion. In order to um, try to douse what was being said out there in the public, I, I felt that was the only option they were left with to give that narrative. I wouldn't know. I'm not in. Kano State, I wouldn't know if there's a policy of the state government uh, trying to get people who are pagans and to, to uh, convert them to religion of their choice. I heard some persons who, some persons have also been 
converted to, somebody who were elected to be Christians have also been sent to the Christian community in, in, in the states and asked to be uh, absorbed into, the, into their own religion. But I, wouldn't, I, don't, I, can't, I don't have fact to, data to verify all of, all of this. But let me just say that um, uh, religion is, uh, is, uh, is a fundamental right. And um, even the prophet himself said that there should be no compulsion in religion, right? So uh, I saw that video. I was a bit, uh, I, I thought to myself, OK, let's just give them the benefit of a doubt that this young girl wants to be a, a Muslim. But I looked at the environment, and I looked at how this girl was sitting. And you saw, you saw uh, a case of someone who was not actually guided by his own, uh, uh, his own will. You understand? Even though some person said the governor asked him, do you want to be a Muslim or a, or a Christian? And she purportedly answered that she wants to be a Muslim and went on to recite some, uh, um, some uh, relig uh, Islamic, uh, you understand. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't know. But the impression created out there was a, a, someone who was on, under duress and who couldn't say uh, any, any other thing apart from what was expected of her yeah, to, should, to Should say. the response have been different uh, in, in trying to douse that religious tension um, that might come out of this? Uh, should people begin to read meanings to it? Should there have been a different response that would have done better in pushing the conversation away or explaining the behavior of the governor? Well, let me just, uh, even though at the risk of uh, repeating myself, I think in the circumstances, that was the only that, option. Was, that was okay. the only option to claim that this was a, a, a policy of the state government trying to get pagans from some communities and converting them to religions of their choice. But the question is, was it actually the choice of the young girl to be a Christian or, or a Muslim? That question, I don't know who's going to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, You're Raymond, welcome. for your You're thoughts welcome. on the program. You're Always welcome. appreciated. Thank you. All right. We'll take a plus report now. And when we return, I will give my take. Stay with us. With the lockdown being experienced in the federal capital, many residents had high hopes of receiving palliatives from the federal government. After several days of staying indoors, it became increasingly more difficult to enforce the lockdown. Some of them told Plus TV Africa that they needed to go fend for their families. I came here to, to sell my agri agricultural product because I need to feed my family. I need to take care of my children. They don't know what is coronavirus. If government give money to share for people, the people who carry money, they don't take money. Nobody collect any cobble. Every me serves, they register me. I never receive anything. President announced that they they are making measures for over two million houses households now, but it's not reaching anywhere. They can do it by BVN. If it reaches me, it's going to reach demand that doesn't even have an account number. In a bid to support those desperately in need, the FCT administration assured they would be provided palliatives. After several days of putting modalities in place, the official flag of ceremony finally arrived. About 600,000 bags of palliatives were marked to be distributed across the six area councils of Abaji, Amak, Buari, Gwagwalada, Kuji, and Kwali area councils. The FCT Minister of State, Dr. Ramatu Tijani, says the items are expected to caution the effect of the sit at home presidential order on the less privileged in the society. Five people multiply by the 100 targeted poor and vulnerable in each area council. That means each area council will be receiving goods targeted at five multiplied by 100,000. That is 500,000 poor and vulnerable people. I think that will go a long way uh, to cushion the effect of they sit at home. Mrs. Tijani says modalities have already been put in place to ensure transparency and avoid corruption during the distribution process. The representatives of the political parties at the lower level, at the ministerial level, we have the senator and the two representatives of the House of Representatives of the Federal Capital Territory, the representative of the Khan again and the League of the Man, the youth, the women, and then we have civil society organizations. So this will go a long way to ensure inclusivity. We have 62 cameramen. But in Abadi now, since we are taking it one area council per day, 
we have six video men, six, uh, ten video men and ten cameramen to also snap or videotape and upload as is happening accordingly. The Abajiria Council Chairman Abdurrahman Ajia, while thanking the FCT administration, assured that the palliatives will go a long way to reducing the hardship being faced by residents. Today, we are receiving palliatives in Iran's cushion, the effect of this lockdown on our people, most especially the vulnerable ones, who have seen and heard of how these palliatives have been submitted in some states. And the complaints that follow the solution. And I want to assure you that that of FCT, starting from Abadi, is going to be a different one. Mr. Ajia promised that the distribution would be fair and transparent. Coronavirus or COVID-19 doesn't know time, doesn't know religion, and doesn't know doesn't have any boundary. As such, this validity is for all of us, regardless of whether you are indigent or not indigent, if you are invited to fall within the categories of those that are vulnerable. Idon Joseph, Plus TV Africa. With the increasing number of infections in Nigeria and Lagos spewing out the lion's share, there are concerns that the lockdown might not be working as thought. And there is a growing sense that people are becoming impatient with it. The concerns are valid considering the massive social economic disruption being experienced across the world, to which Nigeria is not immune. With each passing day, jobs are becoming increasingly at risk and small businesses are facing hard times, shutting down even. But we cannot afford to be impatient. This is a novel virus. And whether copy or not, lockdown has worked for some countries, helping to reduce the spread. While we look for our own unique ways, we cannot afford to exacerbate the risk we already face. There is no known antidote for this virus as at yet. We must hold strong. Government must avoid distractions and not relent in working for the people at this time. Somehow, I agree with the submission that COVID-19 pandemic will gift our leaders, might I add, those that are willing to learn, some lessons in humility and regrow their sense of responsibility. Let us take this time out as a country to rethink our national values and begin the process of real social re-engineering. And that is my take. Thank you for watching. You can watch previous episodes on our YouTube channel at Plus TV Africa. Until I see you again, please be well.